Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Patient Convert Podcast. I'm really excited to have a special guest on today, Leslie Tracy. Leslie um, is an ex- expert in the aesthetic space, which is a space that we work in a lot as well. But she's got some pretty unique perspectives on how she's helping ex- aesthetic practices kind of grow and carve out some space in their geographical territory. So Leslie, thank you for joining us today. I want you to kind of start by introducing yourself and, and what you do for aesthetics practices. Yeah, sure. So uh, Justin, um, thanks for having me. And hi, guys, how you doing? But yes, um, I um, have two companies. So I have Tracy Donovan Insurance and Retirement Services. So that really focuses on, you know, financial strategy, both from a personal and a business perspective. Um, so that you could build the most value in your business uh, before you decide to exit on your terms. Um, and then um, I also own a company called Diamond Hands Media, and we are exclusively um, focused on working in the medical athletics field. So you'll see us at different trade shows or, you know, doing things with um, different corporate brands. So it's, it's really fun. Everything that we do, you know, centers around aesthetics. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. It's got to be interesting, and, and you and I talked a little bit to it, is aesthetics, uh, especially kind of the med spa space particularly, is really so fragmented because if you look at a surgical practice, you got surgeons yeah. in the med spa space, really kind of anyone, so to speak, using the term loosely, can start a med spa from an esthetician to a plastic surgeon that rolls one out of their practice. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, with that, there's got to be a lot of challenges, even people coming to your door, assessing kind of where they are at, what they're actually trying to do. So how do you even kind of get started identifying if it's a good fit for somebody to work with and starting to give them advice on what they should be thinking and doing if they're really going to grow a successful med spa because there's just such a fragmented space? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like. Derm practices that do aesthetics are going to be different than plastic surgeons that do aesthetics that are different than nurse practitioners or physician associates that do aesthetics or have you. But, you know, the main concepts, um, the underlying principles are the same. So something that I want to preface this conversation with is that I'm not a business consultant in the traditional sense of the word Mm -hmm. because, you know, I leave that to my girl, Terry Ross. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) you know, I don't know. Or Kaylee Lindholm. So it's just like I am not a business consultant in that sense. Um, but when someone comes to me, I have to identify if it's a good fit for our group to work with. So it's, it's not about if if it, it's, it's both ways, if that makes any sense. So when someone comes to me, typically, ideally, I, I work with people that are med spa startup hopefuls to yeah. those who are more established, you know, doing seven, eight, nine million dollars a year. And it's a vastly I know, I would, different. I would imagine, yeah, that's the two polar opposite ends of the journey. Yeah, it's vastly different. But that's why I'm able to work nationally because I'm so just pinpointed in who I work with. So with someone who's like a, a beginner med spa, you know, we're at that point in time, it's like, you, you don't even know if you're going to survive. We're just looking at the personal yeah. planning. Oh, yeah. We're not. Yeah. And then I'm going to like, there was someone that I work with um, and she's very successful now. But when she started, I was like, okay, you might just need to roll over your little 401k, you know, get some protection things in place, like make sure you protect your income, your, dis- you know, get disability policies and basic life insurance, things like that, so that you can just be protected on your own. Because at that point in time, it's about self-preservation yeah. when you start your business. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Are those the common things on the on that side, the startup side, because of how competitive and probably the that a lot don't survive that you kind of are, are generally advising people when you walk into a med spa situation that you're saying these are the things that you need to do, especially starting out. Yeah. So I'm just like protect yourself in the beginning, you know, and, and that's that. And then I usually recommend them to a business consultant to really get them mm-hmm. yeah. to start, you know, getting on that trajectory for growth. And then I'm like, when you're really there, then we could do some r- really exciting things when you start getting employees that you start having cash yeah. flow and you, then we can start doing some exciting things. So I can work with a, a beginner or a spa hopeful, but it's more focused on the personal side. It's not going to be any different than gotcha. me working makes with a, lot of sense. a nurse working in a hospital or something. Yep. It's not going to be any different because I'm like, you don't have any yeah. cash flow for us to do anything else. That makes <laughs> a lot of sense. So when, when does it turn from the personal to the business side, kind of when does that arrive? Is it when they start hiring employees, they start buying equipment? Is there a certain cash flow level? Like kind of when does that transition as a startup med spa person listening now that's a 
it's time to start thinking differently. Well, especially when you start having employees and you start mm-hmm. having other people that are perhaps injecting or you have a full time front desk person, things like that. When, you know, because, you know, some of my clients have up to 20 employees, they're going to have different needs than a, a, a single shingle practice. So oh, yeah. when you're in kind of like the mid phase, because, you know, the startup, there's the mid phase and, you know, that growth phase. And then there's like, you know, OK, we're kind of ripping and roaring and we're just kind of really tweaking things. It's like when you start having employees, you really want to start thinking about those things. Like, how am I going to start attracting and retaining the best people in this industry? Yeah. Because something that I've seen, you know, because I'm heavy in the, I don't know, they have so many different names for it. You know, it's standards and mid-levels or whatever. I'm really heavy in that market. You know, the PA nurse yep. practitioners. Yeah. And what I find is a lot of turnover, a lot of turnover. Imagine. Because, you know, I see the business owner, they want to have people working for them. However, they don't understand the importance of in, investing in other people beyond the paycheck standpoint so that they continue making money off of other people's efforts. You know, Nick Long, yeah. this guy called the OPE, other people's efforts. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. So, and, and so like, you know, when you look at someone that has, you know, a few employees, you're like, okay, what are you doing for health insurance for your people? Mm-hmm. You know, are you subsidizing that at all? You know, if you have these injectors here, you know, how are you making sure that if they get disabled, that they're still getting an income? How are you protecting your business if your star employee who brings in 40% of the revenue suddenly passes away or suddenly gets disabled? What are you doing to make sure immediate cash flow goes into your business and they're okay too? We look at all of those things because, you know, that type of planning is really important. You know, right? Are you are you offering oh, sure. any, any investments for your people? So my business partners do all the investment stuff. I don't focus on that. I focus on the risk management, but what are you doing to keep them? And and so it's like when we talk about those questions and, and those things, you really have to think about what do you want to do in the future? Do you want to just continue just having something where people are going to be churning and burning all the time? Or do you want to have something where it's sustainable, people want to stay there and you're giving them value? Yeah, that's a great point. I'd be curious because it's something that we see all the time when we go to med spas and you and you hit on it that in a med spa situation, the uh, kind of the people inside can carry so much weight from a revenue generation Mm -hmm. and a brand building. It's kind of like similar to, say, a salon. You got your salon share, so to speak, but you're driving in all the customers and you can have like a master injector that's known in the area as popular on social media. And like you said, could be driving like 50 percent of the weighted revenue that's coming into the practice because of what they built personally, which is a little bit scary because they have almost leverage over the owner at that point in terms of like, I can take my business to another med spa down the road. Mm-hmm. So how how do you advise the owners to kind of mitigate that risk? And is it like creating like SOPs for other injectors, like getting them on board? Like, what do you do to kind of manage that so you don't end up kind of, I mean, kind of being having the business run by the employee almost that's gained that level of popularity. <laughs> I mean, standard operating procedures, I mean, of course, that's a, we're getting to Terry Ross field. Um, but, yeah, you know, yeah, standard yeah. operating procedures, of course, are really important for any business. And as Terry always says, you got to train, train, train with those type of things. Um, however, we're, we focus. It's like, how can you retain this star person? Because yeah. I always say, you as a business owner, you do need to open the curtain a little bit to your people. Yeah, especially yeah. like your really Good valued point. people, because mm-hmm. if they oh, yeah. think it's so easy to run a business, they don't see costs of goods. They don't see, you uh, know, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, they don't yeah. see, you know, you like over struggling. Like, oh, man, I got to make sure I make payroll. They don't yep. see taxes, you know, like you do, and all unless you're paying them ten ninety nine. That's another thing altogether. We're not going to. No, go that's there. that's a good point because there <laughs> is it, it, there's an easy assumption to say like this is I just show up, mm-hmm. I turn the lights on, and people show up on my chair, and you miss the whole exactly. entire thing that's behind it of actually running a business. Exactly, because I always say like you know a, a good practice, any good business, it looks smooth on the surface like a duck, you know, yeah. so, so as it should. Yeah, look yeah. like a stereotypical little cliche thing of like like a duck, you know, you see like gliding along, but underneath they're feet are like, like yep, you know yep. they're going 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 and a lot of the practitioners that work for these business owners they don't see that side because they don't have to deal with it and then they're like ah, i'm leaving and i'm gonna start my own practice five miles down the road and it's just like honey and so that's why i think it's important for business owners to and kind then of, they call you and you're like we need to set you up for some personal protection here <laughs> because you didn't know what you're getting into <laughs> exactly so i think it's important to to kind of like you know um open that veil a little bit and let your people in 
so they understand. And then there's things that you can do to make sure, or not make sure, but entice them to stay. Like, yeah. you know, something that my business partners do, you know, a deferred compensation plans. Yeah, some golden sharing. green cuffs kind of thing. Yeah, profit sharing, yeah, those yeah. type of things. Or you can even do um, something called like um, an executive bonus where it's like, you know, you're mm-hmm. putting a certain percentage of whatever they make aside each year. And you're like, okay, in 10 years, you're going to have access to this pot of money that we're putting aside for you. So there's different things, like like you said, the golden handcuffs, there's different things that yep. you can do to incentivize amazing people. So not only are they earning a great income, but they also have a sense of ownership in what you're doing. So, you know, they, they could turn off at five o'clock and go home. Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, now what, because this is kind of falls into the marketing side, but goes back to the more that at the employee level, those people are investing in their own brand, obviously the, the bigger the benefit to the owner. So do you, are you having conversations with them about kind of, you got to get, you got to get them on board in terms of helping you build the organization. It can't just be on you because again, a lot of that revenue can be driven by the people that are engaged in collecting demos and content and growing their social media alongside of it. So do you talk to them at all from a marketing positioning standpoint of what they need to be thinking about to kind of empower their employees? Well, that's, that's, it's like, I don't get into that as deeply because like I said, with our video production company, it's literally video production. Yeah, we're going to talk to that in a second. Uh, Yeah, I'm all Uh, about it. Yeah, and then so it's just like, you know, since I have so many connections in the industry, you know, we're very careful to to say, this is where we're expert at and this is where we stay. We could dabble a little bit. Like we can have a, you know, a couple of general things that we'll say to somebody because of course it's very important if you have a team member for them to be, you know, Yep. They associate with you, say, you know, because like there's this beautiful med spa tech. I love this med spa owner. She has, you know, the name of her spa. She runs all her social media. She only works 20 hours <laughs> a week it. and she's making bank. And and she and so all the people that work for her, they have their social medias, but it says like the name is like their name. And then the last part of yep. it is the name yeah. of her med spa. So she like yeah. has it as a requirement. And then they build their social media. They build their social media and she's a trainer. She trains her people. And so they look up to her that. as well. Um, and, and so it's just like, you know, having your people and then she's also so involved in the community and like they do a lot of community events. It's like, even if we get five new clients from every community event we do, she's mm-hmm. like, we're at every community yeah. event in that community. Yep. They're so ingrained. And so I think just getting your people on board like that, you know, constantly training them, constantly helping them understand how they tie into the bottom line of the practice as a whole. And it's about us, not me, because there's some practices that they're so ego driven. They're like, oh, it's about me. It's about me. No, she built a great team environment, you know, yeah, it's yeah, kind of like for a sure. tribe. and I think that that's something that, you know, has to be cultivated. And the important stress, like you said, that it's not only the business owner marketing on the main business page, but all those people should be feeding that main business page. So not call them to book. Okay, call this number. What yeah, does associate yeah, with sure. the main business? Yep. And then it's book. not the wild, wild west too. And that's what <laughs> I can I see in a lot of practices is they they don't kind of get control over that situation. And then it really does turn into kind of like mm-hmm. a salon where you own your own chair and you're doing your own 1099 thing. And it becomes crazy, crazy fragmented. Mm-hmm. And it creates... I think an unhealthy level of internal competition between the people who are trying to bring people through the door for the benefit of the business. Before we, mm-hmm. before we switch over, mm-hmm. cause I do want to talk about the video marketing side. What with the mm-hmm. other end of the spectrum that you mentioned, helping those nine, 10, $12 million med spas that are just crushing it, either exit or just continue mm-hmm. to stay at that level. We've talked about kind of the other mm-hmm. end and even the people in the middle, obviously all of them are more than likely aspiring to be those. What do those people look mm-hmm. like? Are there are there commonalities between them that they're just, they either get these things, they're doing it right, or the people on the other end need to be thinking about even today. So if they do ever want to sell their business, they're not stuck. So give, give us, give them some of the the knowledge that you see on the other end. Well, what I see is definitely they have a system for getting new clients in the door. They have a well to they go have a to. Very, very strong. Yeah. Yes, they have a very, very strong marketing system. They have a strong system for follow up, and they have people who play their roles. You know, so front desk is going to make sure that they're following up with people, doing what they need to do there. You know, the nurses 
or they're at PAs, if they're just there to perform and inject or have you. So I, I see what I see as a thread among very successful med spa owners. Like I said, they have very, very strong marketing and they have, like, you know, as far, and it doesn't even mean yeah. strong Instagram yep. or because there's some ones that are, have mm-hmm. been in business for like 20 years yeah. and their books are full, but they have a strong process that's repeatable, like rinse and repeat of how they've been getting their clients. And so I think that's one of the main things because some, as some what I've seen too, some people, they want to open up a 4,000 square foot facility before they've really determined how they're going to truly get people to walk into the door and what's their secret sauce. Yeah, that is and a like, great point. And I'm like, honey, I'm like, why are you opening that? Like, you don't even have an client yet. Yeah, we see I'm that like, way too this, much. And that's the terrible. death of the business before it even starts. Death. Yeah. Death. Like I, yeah. I there was this one Mets Butler I know. Her husband totally bankrolled it for her or whatever. This is generic enough, right? Hope <laughs> it sounds not- generic <laughs> enough. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> and her husband bankrolled her vet spa because he he makes a, a buku bank money, but she's like completely in a deficit. Yeah. And yeah. she's like, I've seen like three clients this week. I'm like, honey, you better do something about that. And she doesn't even live in the community. Yeah. Which is also another kind of ick. So um, I, I just I just think it's it's really important to have un- identify where your clients are coming from and start small. All the big ones that are very successful, they started small. They're like, I was in a one room place until it was busting out the seams. Yeah. Uh, and then go ahead. That's a great I think that is a huge point that entrepreneurs and startups like just completely miss the boat on the ones that don't mm-hmm. succeed. And it's like, mm-hmm. you just cannot get ahead of your skis. And most mm-hmm. of the people, like you said, that are at the nine to $12 million, they have a huge facility. And some of them even don't have huge facilities. Mm-hmm. They did not get ahead of themselves. They practiced yes. patience and constantly reminded themselves, I'll get there eventually. And, mm-hmm. and and that's like, you can usually always tell when you walk through the doors and just like you said, you're like this. There's no way you can sustain this because you don't even have a game plan to go out and get people. Exactly. So start small, but have a big vision. I love and it. That's a good that's way to think about it. That's a big thing because it's like if you don't have a vision for what you want to do and just kind of meandering out there, you're never going to have a North Star or something that you're running towards. So it's fine if you have a one location place or, or sorry, a one room place. So if you're renting a suite. Um, you know, because I know that there is um, some med spa owners who have gotten into the real estate market now. It's quite sexy. And they have <laughs> sweet. Yeah. And they're like, okay, yep. you new injectors, like, come on in. We got you. Yep. You could rent to this for me. I've never, I've seen quite a few people do that. Shout out to Nurse Christy in uh, New York. Uh, <laughs> she has a really great establishment. And so it's just like, yeah, that that's that's really it. Just having that vision, but starting small. And like you said, don't get beyond your skis. And I, and I bet you've had a lot of conversations because it's even, it, it really kind of harkens back to even like a lot of the journey that me and my wife went through where we did, like we cut our cable, we cut our internet. I worked at a Starbucks for over a year. We lived in a 600 mm-hmm. square foot apartment. Mm-hmm. And that was part of the journey. And yes. it's also learning, I think, uh, some self-confidence because there can be a lot of self-doubt there. Like even for oh, our yes. instance, when you look at the people that are in front of you, like how are we going to get there? And it's mm-hmm. kind of embarrassing where we're at now. But mm-hmm. I think it's part of the journey and you got to have some confidence. There's nothing wrong with being the 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 one shingle, like you said, having a mm-hmm. really small space to start or renting a space to start. It's all part of the journey. And yes. all of the people that are doing where you, what you aspire to be, 99% of them started exactly there. And one day you'll mm-hmm. be there and you'll be the empowering voice as you tell your story along the journey. So it's kind of reminding yourself there's nothing to be embarrassed by how small you are. Mm -hmm. You just continue to to focus on the right things. You'll be the one sharing your journey to all of those people that you've been in their shoes. You're just happy Mm -hmm. to be in them right now. Exactly. And and then, you know, another thing too, it's just like, if you like going back to SOPs and standard, standard operating procedures, it's like having an experience for your people. You can give someone an experience and they only have five clients, but you give each of those clients a beautiful experience Mm -hmm. and they're going to be singing your praises. And then you're going to, you know, so you'll get that word of mouth. Um, Then you'll get those testimonials and they'll keep them coming back and they'll bring their family and they'll bring their friends. And it's been statistically proven when someone comes to you based on a referral, they're less likely to ask for a discount because that trust Mm, is already there. Yeah. That trust is already there. So it's like typically, you know, one of my clients refers me to another med spa owner or a plastic surgeon. They're ready to do whatever they need to do. Yep. You know, it's like and and that's how, you know, you should work in your practice with people, you know, start small, 
have a vision, have a standard operating procedures from the start, give a great experience to everyone that walks through the door. And also like my big thing, I always talk about, make sure you have a a, a, a protection success plan. Like, you know, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting mm-hmm. your money makers, which is your ability to work. You have your insurance plans, you have your investment plans, even if you have to start small, because it, you know, it's, if it, you have to build value in your business over time, over time, over time, and hopefully that's going to be what allows you to sail off into the sunset, or you can retire, quote, quote, into your business and you're not, yep. you're, you're not exiting, you're not but maybe you just take them more as a back seat. And you yeah, have you a built great a lifestyle mid-level. business, like you said, yeah. that 20 you hour work great... week or the four hour work week kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And so you had to decide in the beginning, do you want to retire into your business? Do you want to sell your business or do you want to just liquidate your business when you're mm-hmm. and, and, and those and if you kind of understand where you possibly want to go and try and vision it out for yourself, it's going to affect how you do all the things in your in your in your practice and, and how you do things in your a personal financial and business financial strategy. For sure. Yeah, that's a great point. How how often do you advise the owners that you work with or just kind of the owners in general to be evaluating, like you said, the kind of their per- personal protection game plan, the insurance, whether it's for their employees, it's for them personally, how often should they, as they continue to grow, kind of go back and readdress, do I have enough protection here and there and elsewhere? Annually. Okay, annually. You right. know, annually. So, of course, with your investments and my business partners who, who speak to that stuff more, they're going to say, okay, they meet quarterly yeah. or whatever. But with like, you know, your, I call it your protection success plan, but those things, you want to do that on an annual okay. basis um, because, you know, your needs change. And because that all ties into estate planning, which are legal documents that all mm-hmm. ties into business succession planning, which also requires a legal documentation. Because if something happens to you tomorrow, who, who does your practice go to? Yeah. Great point. Can't just go to anybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, if your husband is not. All those efforts were for not. For for nothing. And then all those people that depended on you. So it's like, I'm so heavy on risk management because it's like, because it's in my own life. So my my brother-in-law, he passed away last year. He was only. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He he was 43 years old. And, you know, he was the provider for my sister and their three children. Mm -hmm. And they were married 20 years. He got a stroke. He was disabled in a nursing home for seven months and then he passed away. They didn't have that protection stuff in place. And imagine that co- caused so much devastation just for my sister and my my three niece and nephews. Of course, we helped. We had to. Oh, but yeah. now imagine something happens as a business owner. What happens to all your people? What happens to your family? What happens to all that debt that you recruit to to run? So those things yeah. have to be reviewed on an annual basis to make sure your estate planning, your insurances, your business session planning is doing everything that you want it to do. Because if you don't determine what you want to happen, if something happened, the government's going to determine if you pass away. Yeah. And that is not what you want. Hell no. Yeah, we have seen some unfortunate stories over the year. We have one, again, I'll do a kind of a generalization as well, where we had a, a longtime client, um, in a non-surgical subspecialty Mm -hmm. and there was a physician that had been practicing for like 40 years in the area Mm -hmm. had a very successful practice again not much on the marketing side because he had just was had been there forever so everybody knew who he was he was booked out Mm -hmm. three to six months in advance and our physician and he he was like you couldn't have anybody that you would want to like purchase and take over your practice and take care of your patients more than this guy Mm -hmm. so he was like such a perfect fit and he spent years trying to buy his practice like it was more than time for him to kind of retire and be able to enjoy his later life he was like in his 70s at that Mm -hmm. point and he tried for years and years and years and the guy got i believe it was pancreatic cancer one of the very aggressive cancers and passed away like within three months and his whole entire organization dissolved just dissolved away after 40 years of practice and just died on the vine it was so unfortunate to see we were like right in the middle of working for them too and It broke his heart, too, because there was nothing that they could do at that point. Once he passed, that was all locked out and and the family couldn't do anything either. And it just all went away. Yeah. And that's the thing, especially with medical practitioners that own your own practice. You don't want everything you work so hard for to like, like you said, to die on the vine. You have to have those conversations. You have to have a good quote unquote wealth team. You need to have 
you know, your insurance agent or financial advisor, sometimes they're the same. We have a team, we have both, Mm -hmm. you know, you do need to have your estate planning lawyer. You do need to have your business lawyer. Sometimes they're both, but it's better to have an estate planning person who only deals with the state than trust and business succession. They understand Mm -hmm. that stuff. You know, good CPA, you need to have those pieces of your wealth team working together on your behalf. Not everyone working in their own silo or silo, uh, whatever. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you have to have them. (laughs) Yeah, and you have to have them, you know, working in consort for you. And and, and it's just like, and, and, and that's how we run our work. So when we meet with our clients, we're asking, who's your CPA? Who's your estate planning attorney? Let's get everybody on the same page. Just take care of some basics up first, but let's start the longer process of getting these things taken care of. And we have meetings with their attorneys. We have meet joint meetings with their CPAs or what have you. And so everybody's accountable for their piece in this person's financial strategy. And yeah. I think that's the most beautiful way to do it. Otherwise, you're yeah, wasting time and many times you're wasting money because if, if something's wrong, you got to redraft it or do it. It's like, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen on the other side, my my sister has become... She's a partner at a law firm in, in Orlando, but has come one of the, the more well-known and well-respected wills trust in the state's attorneys in the state of Florida, even Beautiful. sitting on the at the state level for the um, bar association and helping write a lot of the legislation. Yeah, she's on the reptile committee. She runs a couple of committees at the state level. And but she's even like right now in August, she's gonna finally finish up a 10-year um litigation over a will in a state. And that's just, it's a probate case. Yeah, probate case, dec- a decade long. And she deals with that stuff all the time because she's a civil litigator. So she's in court dealing with it. And it's unfortunate. It's not to be morbid. It's expensive to die. And if you don't have a good plan, it gets even more expensive. And to have a Will's Trust in the state's attorney on the back end because you didn't do it on the front end is not what you want. Mm, it's, it's a, a mess. mess. And I always say, mm. I'm like, if you, I'm like, you know, all, <laughs> you want to realize like your whole estate is completely public. Yep. And it's like, do you want mm-hmm. that? For your family yeah. and for everybody, like they can just look it up and be like, oh, let me see this person died six months yeah. ago. Let me yep. see what they were working yeah, with. Yeah, won't realize it. And it's just like, it's not private. It's not a private probate. It's not a private process. I could read probate records from a couple yeah. years ago. Like they're, they're there in the library. Sometimes I read probate records from the 1800s. Just, I just, just, just leave me alone. <laughs> like that's just what I do. I, I, I like reading probate records. I think it's really interesting. But yeah, so it, it, it's so like, it, just, just kind of, no, know, it's just like really, our main focus with our with our mental health that is clients is to help them, you know, grow and you know protect their practice. You know, yeah, but be proactive is kind yeah. of your point. Is you can't wait until because it will be too late because you, you you don't know when something like that could happen. Exactly. So, so get with somebody like yourself and get that it can build a good team around you because it does take many different it people does. with many different expertise to get exactly. it right. Exactly. So it's like grow, protect your practice, attract and retain yep. the best in the industry. And then, you know, exit on their own terms, not the government's terms, <laughs> not anybody else's terms, but mm-hmm. exit yeah. on your terms. And, and the last thing I'll leave on on that point, let's don't ask me anything else, you know, for our more established business owners, we do have a, a process we call a core value. So it's an informal business valuation. And it's um, formulated mm-hmm. by MIT or what have you. And it's a really great thing. It's an exercise they can go through. So they use their EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Yep. And, you know, based on their industry, it will let them know, okay, if these are your weaknesses, these are your strengths. And it talks about their market drivers. And it's so cool, but it's like it shows them if you continue on the trajectory, you're losing out on possibly this much money in value of your business. And these are things that you can yeah. fix. And this is approximately what your business is worth right now. And so that's where the fun starts. So when I do that with the business owner. I take care of my piece, of course, you know, which is the insurances. Mm-hmm. My partner takes care of the investments. But then I'm like, okay, business consultant to get their marketing yeah. up, you know, look at, you know, recurring revenue streams, whatever, looking at those things so that they can continue to grow. Because my whole thing is all my clients, if they're going to work with me, they have to commit to being value accelerators, both personally and in their yeah. business. So that that's just what it I, is. I love it. That, and yeah, that sounds really interesting too, because that, that paints a, a picture, could be a scary picture, but a picture you can fix if you n- understand yeah. and have somebody like yourself that can help put a game plan together to get it fixed. All right. So exactly. with the time remaining, I want to, I want you to put your other <laughs> hat on the video marketing side, because uh, that's, that's the hat I live, <laughs> live every day. So yeah, I'd love to yeah. talk to 
kind of obviously understand a little bit on the video production side, what you're doing. So tell a little mm-hmm. bit about kind of what your core focus is there. And then I love to get mm-hmm. into kind of how we use video to grow aesthetics practices, especially on social media, because mm-hmm. it's such a powerful tool. Oh, I know. Reels and all that stuff is oh, popping. Yeah. I need to get better at my reels myself. I'm like, everyone on social media, I'm just like, but so basically... So uh, my business partner and I, he's also my life partner. I love it. I, I, my, my <laughs> wife is my business partner as well. So I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's like, because I'm like very big picture visionary and he's, you know, he's from Czech Republic. So Eastern European, he's like, quack, quack, quack. Yeah, yeah. he's just like, you know, he's like, no, we've got to execute. It's two by this day. Boom, 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 boom. Then it's just like, it's beautiful. But in any case, um, in our team, we have a really great team. But what we do at Diamond Hands Media is a video production only for the medical aesthetics field. So, you know, we're really blessed to work with some really great brands. Um, you know, we do things like, you know, you'll see our team sometimes at trade shows. I'm um, like, we covered Aesthetic Next. You know, we were over at um, Music City Scale recently doing some work with the Lumi MD, one of our brand partners. Like, and so we were, we're doing, you know, a video production for events. We also do for aesthetic schools for their procedure videos. So they can oh, have yeah. that evergreen yeah. content mm-hmm. for their students. So we, it's like that more kind of academic type of video yeah, sure. style. So it'll be like, you know, like two to three vantage yeah. points or have uh-huh. you. Um, so we do that. Um, and then, of course, for med spas, so our, our, our ideal, our top yeah. clients oh, yeah, are for sure. big corporations, of course, and like the and and the like the aesthetic conferences. And then, of course, we love to work with our med spa owners who value having a good image in the marketplace. And so, like, you know, I know Gal Derma, yep, yeah. like they, they have these, like, really nice moving backgrounds mm-hmm. and stuff. So we love working with their web developers and getting them really nice, something really nice for their, for their oh, website yeah. or, you know, the, their um, marketing videos. We don't we don't really do reels and things like that. That's not our area. We're more, um, you know, long for yeah, the academic. Yeah, kind of brand level video. So what exactly from that standpoint, even at the at the practice level, because you're not doing a lot of those like kind of like you said, like demos and the 30 to to 90 second style video. But even when it comes to brand positioning and the use of video and investing in video as you're growing on your site, Mm -hmm. like you said, to tell your story, Mm -hmm. to make it interactive. uh, What advice do you have? What should they be thinking about in terms of in the investment and the impact that that can make Mm -hmm. in terms Mm -hmm. of growing the business? Yeah, I mean, because there's intangibles and tangibles. And, you know, sometimes there are people like, oh, my God, I don't know. I don't see the ROI. I don't see the ROI. <laughs> I'm like, honey, I'm like, if you have a great brand, that's only going to increase your For value sure. and your public perception in the marketplace. Oh, my God, I'm going to call out another med spot that I love their marketing. Fifth and Wellness in Boca. In Boca, um, we don't do their video production. It's a good spot to, to focus on your brand, too. Yeah, but they have the most gorgeous branding. It's sexy. It's forward thinking. And they use high end. It's like, what the child? Like, I want to go in there and get my facial. <laughs> what I always love too is, in, and we've just worked with a lot of these clients over the years, and I'm sure you have as well, mm-hmm. that will always pull up an organization like that when you engage with them is like, that's what I want to be. But mm-hmm. I don't want to invest in any of the stuff that they've invested in at all. I, I'm it's like, like <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. It, it, you can't, then you can't get there. I can't, I'm sorry, you can't get there. We've worked with plenty of med spas that like pull up all their competitors in the area. And it's mm-hmm. like, I want to do what they're doing on organic social, but I'm not going to commit to making any videos or getting any of my um, estheticians involved in making any videos. It makes like, no but sense. That's literally what you just showed me that they're doing. You so just, how are we going to accomplish it that? It makes no sense. So like, you know, we're not into, because we're very careful brand alignment. We're very, we're, if, we're not, here to put lipstick on a pig. So yeah, if someone yeah, has a terrible website sure. and they have a terrible social media presence, we're not taking them on as a client. We're just yeah, like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. You have this like sexy asset you created and <laughs> and then everything yeah, else is like crap. Yeah. So yeah, for we, sure. we're not taking on clients like that. So it, it's like if you're not committed already to your social media presence, if you're not committed to a great website, think we're not taking you on as a client. Because, yeah. you know, that, and that's just what it is. But if you're committed to change. Well, be, it's a bad investment for them, is. too. Even if they are going to pony up the money, the 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 positive ramifications out of that asset are going to be 100 percent wasted exactly. and lost. We're not going to get exactly. anything. So it. it's like if you, the only time to take someone like that on is if they're committed to the entire process. We'll say, OK, for a few yeah. months, you got to work with this marketing firm and you got to get this 
looking cohesive. You got to get the website. Gotta get your house in order. You got to get the website done, everything. And then we're we're going to come in and sweeten that for you. But we're not mm-hmm. going to put lipstick on a pink. But yeah, that's a great yeah, way. Yeah. So video, video is a great way to tell your brand story. It's a great way for people to kind of feel your presence and essence. And this is why even like the the reels and things are, are so fun because people get to kind of feel you out and they feel like they know you before they even walk in the door. So doing that in a strategic manner and then even, you know, where we come in, like having like a really nice high end about us video and showing, you know, you interacting with your patients, maybe having some patient testimonials or even for your website, having some high end procedure videos. So people are kind of like, like if I was to come here, like what would that process look like? Like I've never gotten Botox mm-hmm. before, I've never gotten threads. Mm-hmm. What does that process look like? And how does a patient feel? Have them talk, have the patient talk about their experience after they've gotten the procedure. So you can build a really great um, library of assets if you're committed to investing into your brand in that way. For sure. I, I couldn't agree more because there's it, the med spa space in particular is in terms of a differentiator is so experience focused. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you going to, what is your experience going to be when you walk through the doors? Yep. And again, not to take away the difference between like a master injector and like an esthetician that's just starting out mm-hmm. and what they can deliver in terms of your results for Botox, not to take anything away from that. Mm-hmm. But from a perception standpoint for a patient, they may not perceive the differences there. So a lot of it relies on there's a hundred people offering Botox in my area, Mm -hmm. which can deliver on the value of what I'm paying for in terms of the experience, the Mm -hmm. follow-up, the the practice itself, all of those. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to really, like you said, through your website, through video, through social media, be able to communicate what it's going to be like when the patient walks through the door. And that's what the good ones do really, really well is they focus on putting experience at, at the forefront through media. Of course. Yeah. Because I mean, it's like, personally, I would never have an esthetician inject my face. Um, I, I, I really, I really believe I, I, I take, I take, um, the stand of like, if you don't, if you don't want to reverse your stuff, you're not touching me. You know what I that's mean? That's good. That's a really good way to think about yeah, it. Yeah. And I, one of my past sure. pictures yeah. and friends, he was like, that's how it should be. He's like, he's like, there's great that's, NPs. Yeah. There's great PAs. There's great plastic surgeons. He's like, but if you don't know how to reverse what you've done, you don't understand anatomy. He's like, you shouldn't be touching anybody. Um, so that is a great way so to think like, about it. Esthetics are not trained in anatomy and yeah. stuff. So any any esthetic that can inject in certain states, I, I'm sure they're probably maybe good. I don't know, but I, I wouldn't trust it. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point for sure. Um, Sorry, that was a little tangent. No, 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 no. That's a, that's, that's <laughs> a really good point. Yeah, because uh, there's other people that are not just physicians that are listening to the podcast. That's a really good point. Yeah. So I'd love to know a little bit more. Like you said, kind of at the top level, um, how device companies on the other side, because you got the people purchasing and then they need to be supporting on the marketing, what they're doing in the video space to not only sell their products, but help support the med spa owner that's purchasing it and how y'all are helping and kind of fitting into that that space as well. Yeah. So, I mean, um, as far as like beauty brands are concerned, the ones that, you know, that are, are kind of like the vendors for these brands, they're they're really focusing on education, I noticed. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of education. Yeah. So it's like so some of the stuff you, you want to see stuff, so a lot of the stuff that we do on their Instagram or what have you, because they have a very, very uh, stringent brand guidelines and like what they, they don't like put like any, I'm like, we got to change that. But anyways, but they'll invest a lot in like their academies, their online academies. But this is how you yeah. use our product. This is how you talk about our product. Um, and so a lot of that internal stuff is going on so that they're really, like I, like I said, helping their end user use their products in the best way. And then they're educating yeah. them about the ingredients of a product or they're educating them about, um, you know, of the science of the product or what have you. So it's like that's where we're doing a lot of the stuff from like the corporate side. It's more of that internal um, engine for their end users. So then the the doctors, the nurses, the PAs are going to these online academies and they're like, okay, and they're learning there. So Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, just just the just end user testimonials, like their KOLs, like, you know, just getting that footage of, of them talking about their experience and why they use that. And and so that's a lot of the things that we're doing on the on the corporate side, besides what we do for um, aesthetic schools and of course event coverage. Now are y'all doing anything 
but most of them have that uh, Allergan's is probably the most popular one, the brand box side of things kind of, I think that they do an incredibly good job of trying to dummy proof the, the post purchase marketing as much as possible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to take the variability out of the hands of what we've been talking about the whole entire time mm-hmm. of the, the, the makeup of med spot owners. Mm-hmm. Do y'all do anything on that side of helping them kind of build out their, for lack of a better term, their brand box, their assets that will then be handed over to the practice owner once they purchase the machine to go out and start marketing it? No. No, not any of that. Is that mostly done in-house for for a lot of it because of the guidelines that so, they have? So for that, they typically have like a marketing or PR Got firm it, that makes that's sense. doing, because it's like pictures, yeah, are, yeah, like yeah. more picture yeah, yeah, focused yeah. and things. We don't, we don't do that stuff. Got it. We're, we're video. Gotcha. Very cool. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, thank you, Leslie, so much for coming on and, and putting both of your hats on and, and talking to us about what med spa owners who are doing it right need to be thinking about and the ones that are aspiring need to start thinking about as well. So let us, before we sign off, let them know um, how, A, they can get that evaluation you talked about, but just get connected mm-hmm. with you in general, whether it is for the video stuff or it's for all of this kind of risk management and everything personally and professionally that you do for these med spa owners. Yeah. So um, guys, I'm definitely say to to start on the financial side first, um, obviously see what was going on there, but um, you could visit me on uh, www.tracy.event dot com for the financial side of things. Um, and then if you are interested more on the uh, video, if you feel your brand is ready for that, um, it's www.diamondhandsmedia.com. And for any of you that really, what I want to offer to you guys, any of you that really do want to know the value of your business and start kind of thinking about that, because you have to start with the end in mind. You should be thinking about that stuff like 10 years before exit or have, if you want to kind of get the wheels turning, I will offer you guys my core value report. It's a free report you can go and take. Um, so you can go to my website and um, in the medical aesthetic resources, um, you could actually take that assessment, um, at least the beginning phase of it, right online. And then my team will be in contact with you to go over the results. And it's a complimentary consultation that I'll be offering you guys. Excellent. Okay. Well, we'll make sure to have all of that in the show notes. And as we go about mm-hmm. kind of promoting the episode, well, thank you so much for uh, taking some time. I know you had mentioned you had even had a, a long journey home last night. So uh, a little fatigued <laughs> on this Friday morning, but thank yeah. you for taking, taking some time uh, to come on and share your expertise with us. We really enjoyed having you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to today's latest episode of the Patient Convert Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and review on your favorite podcast platform. We are on Apple, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and Spotify, or you can sign up to receive the latest episode via email. Just check it out on my agency website or my personal website. And if you are looking for more amazing healthcare marketing information or just to engage, check us out at entropy.com. And for any of my amazing physician liaisons out there interested in growing their physician referrals or learning the strategies that it takes to build highly engaged physician referral networks. Check out my website, kellynot.com, where I have free webinars, free downloads, and of course, my online physician liaison training course, Physician Liaison University. And as always, I'm a huge believer in connecting, engaging, and supporting one another. And the best way we can do that is networking. And I always, always connect with you guys on social media. And one of my biggest social media platforms is LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me there on LinkedIn or Instagram or Twitter at Kelly Knott. And thank you guys again for listening to the Patient Convert Podcast with your host, Kelly Knott.